Hello everyone, today we talk about the 11-11 Sutri agreement between Pascal II and Henry V. Uh, passing through also what Urban II had influence regarding this matters, also through the internal influence of Eva of Chartres. Regarding the settlement of the investiture controversy that would eventually conclude uh, at least formally, uh, but not substantially, with the Concordat of Worms in 1122 uh, instead. Because what, what occurred in this agreement is fundamentally a radical distinction between the temporal and spiritual prerogatives, uh, respectively for the, for the uh, emperor and, and the, the pope that um, fundamentally didn't have any practical consequences, as we will see now, um, but was one of the most, mm, one of the purest fundamentally examples of separation of state and church as early as the 12th century. Was to say, for all those who think that, ah, no, Christendom uh, influenced, was, was, was um, abusing uh, people in, up to you know, yesterday because, you know, they didn't want the separation between state and church. Well, actually, this is present in the very same Gospels, right? And eventually, what happened with the idea that a state was Christian is, is something different from the relation that existed between, in fact, temporal and spiritual power. Um, and we will come back on these topics. I, I don't remember what I, what I already made um investor controversy playlist, but it's one of those topics that, as you know, I attribute a huge importance to because uh, it invests not just uh, the Middle Ages per se, but it's if you want a millinery, part of a millinery path and struggle between the temporal and secular power, that uh, is quite unique in many ways to Western civilization and especially the Middle Ages, like in through these steps in particular settled and uh, provided Europe with to expand further on a level of separation, right, of distinction between absolute and relative that hardly any other civilization had in the same way, and that we tend to underestimate dramatically, both from a moral and a, a scientific uh, point of view. And the setting is also a pretty interesting one that we also you don't often hear about. I mean, the history of papacy that every time you make these videos, nobody watches them for some reason, right? And that's an enormous cultural deficit, right? Not not accepting the importance of uh, Christendom as a necessity in historical understanding uh, basically means to throw out of the window any possibility of having a civilizational uh, vision, capacity, and properly uh, awareness in, in the first place. Uh, but it's the history of two powers that were in difficulty, right? Because this struggle, St. Urban II was clashing with Henry IV um, after the humiliation of Canossa and, you know, at the time of Gregory VII, both Urban II and Pascal II had been part, in fact, of Gregory VII entourage. And you know that the so-called Gregorian reforms weren't, like, um, you know, weren't started to, to last, right? Especially the death of Gregory VII, mm, there wasn't uh, much of a, uh, you know, an expectation regarding the continuation of the same. Figures like Urban II, Pascal II, also Nicholas II, resumed and actually made it happen, right? So much that we talk about the Gregorian reforms because they were just a set of such, um, you know, working path that was not to be given for granted. And in fact, what actually happened in Sutri in 1111 was uh, symbolical in many ways because it, 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 it was not much just of a point of arrival, but a point of, if anything, of pacification, but of opening a new stage of definitions that, in fact, couldn't, wouldn't quite be settled until, until Worms.
and, and we'll see how uh, and why. But it's, it's the history of two powers that were in distress because Germany had been in civil war after the excommunication of Henry IV. You know that Henry V was, you know, as his son, was just, um, you know, Henry IV abdicated. Uh, he was, was forced by the events. The papacy wasn't faring that better, right? Uh, especially the, the, the Ravenate church had acquired great power while... Um, the popes had been, you know, at this point in constant clash with the emperors and made expeditions to Italy, and um, the same control of Rome was complicated. Uh, consider that Sutri is not even a, a random seat because it, it's where Henry the Third had deposed three popes. So, for the papacy to come an, to an agreement in the same palace uh, with the emperor, uh, where the uh, the respective prerogatives were fundamentally detached in, in an absolute fashion or, all, or almost, like we will see there are some conditions, but de facto, so to a point that, in fact, both sides didn't quite have an idea on how to enforce because it was not, not possible, but would bring to the next definition is worth considering. Um, so, again, for the purpose of the situation, it was critical. Right after the death of Gregory the Seventh, it took years uh, for resuming his project um, with, of papal monarchy, uh, and also with much greater mm, prudence, right, uh, caution, uh, in especially in the means by Pope Urban the Second, ten eighty eight, ten eighty nine, who was, by the way the same pope that launched the crusade. Recently we made a video about uh, Norman Sicily and we've seen how the uh, apostolic uh, legacy of to, to, the, to the Norman rulers, in the secular Norman rulers was provided exactly by this pope, um, which was a consequence because it was not something the, the, the same papacy was particularly happy about, but the popes needed the Norman support for uh, also withstanding the imperial uh, pressure. Uh, Urban II was French, was very much soaked in that same culture, that would made a chivalric culture. He, he came from Châtillon, right? So he would know how to cope with the the Normans, right, with, with other Western Franks in that kind of also chivalric culture. But he had also a, a great curriculum. Um, he had been uh, a canonist, right? He came, in fact, from uh, the diocese of Rheims. He was eventually a monk at Cluny, so another center that had, as we've seen in many videos, massive impact on the Reformation, not just a at the monastic level, but properly the, the broader vision of the church. And he had finally been Bishop Cardinal, Superbricarian Bishop Cardinal of Ostia, the port of Rome, uh, as successor of Pier Damiani, by the way. So another uh, extraordinary figure, hermit, monk, etc., that had been um, crucial, right, uh, in the rise of, of the reform, fundamentally, of the papal monarchy. So an extraordinary curriculum, by the way. And his um, indulgence in front of certain transgression of the canons that he accepted exactly as a, as a prerogative of the Pope that is basically the only one that, according to the Dictatus Papa, could provide, with, of Gregory VII, could provide with this authenticity that could dis even dispense of, of the law. Right, if, if the Pope itself himself said that, was however united to a great firmness in the same profession of the Gregorian principles. Right, they were a bit the same, because again it showed that the Pope was above even certain normative uh, rules that had been established just by the Council. Right, it was superior to it. the Council of Bishops, ideally the same ecumenical. And, in fact, the same wide use that he made of the papal law to dispensate, in particular cases, at least from, from the canons, uh, was crucial to reaffirm the Gregorian 
idea of the unlimited papal power of intervention in the government of the churches of all Christendom, right? And this was particularly true when he agreed uh, to the, let's say, the maintenance in, in power of those bishops, that those clergymen that had been essentially invested by, by the secular authority, right? And that could change idea because that was still basically the double threat, yes. The problem was not much like w whether these people had been uh, invested by uh, the same local church or by the, the sect, wh which still occurred because it always occurred, but with the heavy injurance of the secular power. Right? The investiture, of course, was distinguished. But the problem was whether this investiture from the secular authority was licit or not, right? in which way it had. Uh, next to the ecclesiastical one, right? And as you know, at Worms, there would be an agreement that was essentially negotiating on a national level. Like, the emperor could invest bishops in Germany while the pope would do it for the Italian ones. So this um, is how they settled it in the end. But again, the problem was, first of all, defining the spheres of influence. Because up to that point, you see, that's not just the importance of the Gregorian reform, but all what had triggered it in the first place. And as we've seen, we don't have to give it for granted in, in the way it, it happened, but it, it was a, a very powerful response of the church and, and also mirroring, uh, we've seen it in the video about Sylvester II, et etc., an incredibly uh, enlarged uh, universal capacity and charisma and power of of the papacy in Europe um, was, um, in fact, this uh, ambiguous custom, right, set of traditions that had occurred in, uh, you know, that had started, this was a problem since since Charlemagne's crowning, right? Uh, for example, it's not before the, pro the, the Privilegium Ludovicanum by Louis the Pius that the idea that there was also a, you know, a sphere of pertinence, of affair, of um, you know, of the popes in their own possessions that was sanctioned, and it was not to clear the beginning. The, on, in Ottonian times, still, as you know, there, there was an important uh, interf imperial interference with popes essentially, uh, you know, brought and taken away from from. Uh, the Holy See by, by the emperors, right? And um, th it was always very complicated telling the truth because, again, there was always a pro or an anti imperial faction in this mechanism. But nobody had ever settled officially the, the, the two spheres of influence. It's perhaps not even today's objective to explain why this was done at this point, but it's obvious that this stabilization also on some kind of national base was was important for the respective kingdoms to you know to, to interact institutionally among each other because at the end of the day even if the papacy in fact was just uh, controlling I his own assets in a spiritual sense still the the fact that it had a, a great influence especially on the italic affairs and um, that was very complicated for any emperor that had to come in Italy for the crowning from, by the same pope, right? So it was always a matter of, at the end of the day, of foreign relations and how to, to carry out the wrong fact without uh, too much trouble, which instead was, you know, kind of saying the norm. The same Herod V coming at Sutri would... Uh, subdue Lombardy and uh, raid around Tuscany. So it was kind of normal because, again, there was always kind of a pro and anti imperial faction still already at this time, say one century before the Lombard League. Uh, but again, the mechanism had always been the same. At the beginning of the 11th century, it was in theory still uh, an Italic monarchy. Now, the papacy was mediating, as we have seen also with the support of the Normans, for example but within, from within the same cities and the same bishops, right? That was the real thing. It was about making synods, councils to, to test the loyalty of 
of, of the clergy, right, was the majority of the bishops, say, in Italy or France or Germany or from the papal side. It was very complex. And naturally, uh, the national line was not even the thing because, again, also in Germany was plenty of, um, you know, of, uh, of factions that are, even on the base of these agreements that could go more or less in favor of the papacy would be, would disagree and stick to the emperor or not. That's the reason why, by the way, the two sides had exhausted each other in the in the struggle and why they needed an agreement and why would always purpose in empire kind of uh, watch each other's back or was trying to stop <laughs> each other's backs in the meanwhile but still sticking together in a word or another. That, that's what is so beautiful about that, right? That there is a, an antagonistic partnership that develops both of them and so that's why again this, the investiture struggle is probably one if not the single most overlooked uh, civilizationally impacting um, uh, f dynamic in, in in the Western Middle Ages because it, it still concerns something that goes much beyond this um, much more concretely political and in social issues but really have to do with the military and religious understanding of the world right and it does reflect great part of what we, we know from the, the ancient from the old tradition and even modern psychoanalysis actually tells about humanity and that's why it was so damned great right um, you need checks and balancements to make things work right and this was for each other a hell of that right um, so um the um, yeah the the this encompassed by the way not just the the holy Ro the holy the holy roman empire per se but also the entire western christendom right uh, a lot of urban the second and pascal the second work for example was carried out in france in spain it was about the reaffirmation of the necessity of papal investiture for the world western christendom right with uh, an enormous capacity of interference and of organization ecclesiastical administration especially in areas say you know the one we mentioned spain the areas of the reconquista where the the um, the church administration was reorganized as the, the struggle against the muslim um recovered more more land and people um, to Christianity uh, but caution and clemency let's say in the practical action were not enough to uh, start a solution for um, for this struggle investiture struggle that was transposed at this point ideologically on the same level of doctrine and that was because that's what the papal monarchy had done at the end of the day and fueled uh, within the discussion of the problem between the relations between regnum et sacerdotium by the uh, very rich uh, pamphleting that was occurring at the time uh, from, from both sides, right? This is an aspect that we often uh, overlook as well about the Middle Ages, the idea that there was an enormous circulation of ideas and of writings and of words, right? We've been told, ah, no, because public opinion is born in the 18th century blah, blah, blah. this is not true right public opinion has always been there um, and the say the more consider all what we don't know in terms of what was verbal propaganda it was by far the most widespread at this time literally um, you know the, the public value of certain decisions was also about uh, formally the the amount of people participated, what kind of individuals were giving credit to it. Uh, there was a lot of preaching in the streets. Uh, we, we lost historically what the 
the oral propaganda was about, but it was all over the place and it worked intensely, right? And this is just one of the things that the investor struggle contributed to develop in the West as well. Um, so what this means, in, as we've seen also with referring, hinting at the concordat of Worms, is the necessity of a compromise between the most extreme thesis, right? A, an intermediate doctrinal line that was mm, possible to achieve because it was suggested by the consideration that bishop's power is duplex, right? It's both spiritual and temporal, right? So the two things, again, this double thread that, that is, is there since the Gospels. Um, and before that as well, because also the old tradition fundamentally contemplated this somatic aspect, this earthly, material, physical one, and then the 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 spirit the, the, the wholly spiritual, right? The purely uh, uh, the one above. Let's put it in this way. Was was the norm? Was the way? And it is still what what we actually struggle uh, for normally, existentially, even if we don't rationalize it anymore. These people knew it. It was normal, right? It was one of the first. It was the first concern. Right of a medieval person because they they still came from a non secularized and modernized reality where they they had a perfectly clear understanding of it uh, as it's being said polluted today by what we allegedly think was a, an in, an improvement morally or scientifically but it, it wasn't at all right in absolute terms on the contrary which meant essentially negotiating on what kind of you know double confirmation should be from, from both sides and fundamentally establishing which one was the most important, which one, say, the other should have just uh, agreed to form because they had to be invested of both types of, of power, right? So there couldn't be uh, um, an ambiguity, right? And what, what would have been like if, you know, just said no, there's just a purely spiritual power, no temporal one. How how could, for example, the limit between, say, papal power also temporally could have been drawn in that fashion? Because, you know, the church is everywhere, the administration is everywhere. So, um, of course, it would have been like a parallel power next to the secular one, but, say, completely detached from it, with an enormous amount of, not just of... Um, you know, in fact, of merely ecclesiastical assets, but also public ones that had been at some point uh, enfeffed to, to bishops, right? sub enfeffed to, in turn, to other lay, I don't know, knights, for example. So it was a very good, that, that's why eventually the Sutra agreement was not successful in practice for for solving, say, in the matter in theory, right? But at least it was successful uh, in theory, to solve the problem in practice. And there were currents that were already pushing this. Uh, Urban II, already at the time, was, uh, for example, in contact with uh, the ideas of evil. Bishop of Chartres was this eminent French prelate. Who, um, he essentially was one of the, at that point, many canonists of moderate orientation that had pointed out that you know, continuing with that wall-to-wall -wall policy was not sustainable on the longer run because, in the meanwhile, right, Christendom needed an ever more solid um, unity of power, right, and of intents. Um, so there was the opportunity envisaged that to the ecclesiastical ordination of the bishop an um, act of assent by the king should have been accompanied. Uh, this would 
essentially affirm the monarch as the supreme regulator of the temporal matters, at the entrance of the bishop in possession of the assets pertaining to his church. Because remember that since Carolingian times, but this was already the state before, of course the church had cooperated with the, the imperium, whichever it was, right? Bishops had a duty to, to, to bring, for example, some, some amount of troops to the same front lines. Uh, in war, they, they had to provide with an important amount of wealth because this had been negotiated since the beginning, the church had fundamentally substituted itself very often to public administration, was originally imperial, right? it had been granted with some, some negotiations, but it, it was beyond that, it was not just because of these agreements, it was because uh, the entire community saw this as normal, right? the church understood pretty well that the state had to be defended, that people had to go out war to defend Christendom, this is since St. Ambrose uh, fully envisaged, but even before, right, the same evangelic language is military, notoriously. Uh, St. Paul made a, a brilliant trans transposition, of, you know, um, ecclesiastical language, in essentially the, for, for the Roman vocabulary of the time that was revolving around the imperium as also the secular power, not just the military one, but the same thing, right, it was not even properly secular in their own regard, but again, the church was coming as to be the, the only sacred and capable of consecrating the um, same imperium, and that's what had happened in the Middle Ages fundamentally, since Charlemagne's onward at least. So, that's why this is crucial, and also just for modern, alleged Christians who, who believe things that have absolutely nothing to do with any kind of Christian tradition historically about what the relation with the church and the state and violence etc should be right study history because uh, Christianity is not a personal opinion unfortunately <laughs> for uh, unfortunately for those who, you know who don't see this because it, that they they make their lives much worse as in general for not knowing history of religions altogether because this is not just Christendom. It has to do with the old uh, universal tradition that even goes beyond Europe in many ways. So um, this effort of distinction among the different aspects of the ecclesiastical power did not convince Urban II, as we were saying, because he was too intransigent, in a way, and too already inclined to, to, sh to show the effect of uh, authentic authenticative power of the Roman bishop but it was represented in various forms under Urban's successor so much that in 1111 in fact Pope Pascal II adhered to an agreement in Sutri with Henry V that had come there in the Rome fact to be in fact crowned emperor um, as we've seen, he was the same son and successor of Henry IV, so this had a very powerful meaning because he was the uh, essentially the, the one that had succeeded his father as the originally in, in because of the investor struggle and the opposition that Henry IV had met. So the agreement with the church was extraordinary and surprising in in the content because in Sutri the king declared to be wanting to renounce to whichever intervention in the concession of the bishoprics and he promised to respect the uh, goods, the property that had come to the churches by private, from private donations and the revenues connected with the ecclesiastical functioning. While the Pope committed himself to obtain from the bishops the restitution of all the so-called regalia, that is to say, all the revenues of fiscal 
of public uh, origin and of all the jurisdiction and of the powers granted in the past to the churches from the kings, by the kings. And this was incredible, <laughs> if you understand what it means, because it was a, a, a truly rational separation of the religious authority from public power. It, it just properly split the thing without any conviction. Right? Basically, the emperor said, look, I'm not going to interfere whatsoever in any form of bishop's investiture. Right? That is to say, everything that went in the Episcopal hands was not to be touched. Right? On the other hand, the Pope said that the bishops would have had to give back all the, the formerly, the originally, public assets that had been provided also for, you know, for convenient reasons by the kings to them. That is, it's a utopia, it couldn't happen. We'll explain, uh, we explain now how it, it, it was nobody, just this, this was a risky thing to say, by the way. This is the point, that, that both the Pope and the Emperor were basically saying, okay, let's, let's stand on this ideal ground Right, that in theory, this is how things should be. You see, this was, if you want, the perfectly rational and doctrinal settlement of the matter. Right, naturally, importantly, in favor also of of the papacy, because the papacy, in this sense, was affirming itself. I mean, the the emperors were were agreeing to let the uh, the the spiritual power essentially having its own absolute sphere of pertinence, but this is what, in theory, what the point was in principle, right? Even just by, in fact, Christian standards, not the, the papacy, you know, that this is, you see, this is nothing to do per se just with the papacy. This is to do with the church altogether, right? And the relation with the imperium. This could have been valid even without papal monarchy. Now, this happened because the, the papacy had enough strength and power and unit of control to, to assert its own, you know, spiritual charisma and, and authority and influence, also because, you know, Western Christendom wanted that, allowed that, needed that, right? And the same reason why this agreement was ridiculous in practice. But it was of enormous importance as a, as a settlement because it was the, the demonstration that both powers were capable of a constructive uh, relation, right? And, start, and starting from, uh, let's say, that to, to, to negotiate something else. This was a peace, essentially, right? This is the moment in which fully, after decades of struggle, the empire and the papacy signed a, a peace, right? And the emperor was crowned, etc. So it's of excruciating importance. But then they would have had to, in theory, at least, uh, enforce this rule on the empire. It was impossible. In Western Christendom as a whole, it was impossible. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't expect that, obviously. Uh, it would have been a revolutionary thing. It was not, uh, it was not feasible, right, as, uh, as a separation of religious authority from public power. Um, and for all the videos that we've made, especially on post-carol in Europe, but just knowing what the Ancien Regime substantiated itself of, we naturally know that why this was impossible. Because um, uh, of simply of the secular increase of the responsibility assumed by the prelates in the exercise of military and jurisdictional powers and in the fruition of the public revenues. Um, there was no way at the beginning of the 12th century to have a unitary power, right? Just an absolute state could have achieved this. But not even that, because, you see, what would have been the, pro the, the point even of separating state and church that fashion? I mean, they have to back each other after all, so everything they do or say or think has a political impact. 
on the chart. So it's nonsensical, right? What we actually achieved today, by the way, is eliminating um, the moral guard. So basically falling into a statistic um, a delirium where the, the only possibility uh, to the absence of sacred is communism because practically there is no, no moral authority uh, to be even searched for. Right. This is the what, what you gain when when you pretend to, you know, to think that reality is a matter of subjective uh, interpretation. And again, I I don't need to explain the skyrocketing success of Western civilization during the Middle Ages, during which instead this equilibrium between imperial and papacy was the norm. I, I call it equilibrium. And we know how much they quarreled and even fought against each other, but never, never even remotely dreaming to eliminate each other. They needed each other. Couldn't be possible. It was an enormous opportunity for the both of them. And of course, the Sutri agreement didn't have. Sutri is a is a town near Rome, right? It's these um, papal. You know, residences at this point by the way it was uh, again the papacy had quite a difficulty of controlling even great part of the Romans right the same Rome first of all but again I made a video also on how during the course of the 12th century the papacy started building very cleverly its um, seniory especially around Rome in this century because you know, Rome itself was much uh, too much of a uh, tough nut to, to crack. So the agreement didn't have even a principle of execution because it rose, first of all, the protest of all the interested uh, that were the bishops, but together with them, all the powerful that as advocates or vassals of the churches enjoyed right they 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 held um in enjoyment let's say from the bishops to the increase of their own dynastic power revenues and rights of royal origin what would have been the point of saying okay let's cut all these connections for what reason all these connections were designed to keep a very specific politically military and social balance all over europe exactly because both sides could count on each other uh, in this mechanism, this, um, you know, vassalatic uh, forest, it is no doubt how as complicated it was, but com penetrating each other because they were the same people. We assume it, even with, you know, the, the less compromising Urban II, right? Uh, Pascal II was probably a Romagnol. He had a different background. Urban II was essentially coming from a, a noble, a knightly family. These were the same people, right? Uh, you had a, you know, a, a, a brother was, was a lord, another was a bishop, another was a knight. It was completely normal. They shared the same culture. The same, they shared the same uh, status, the, the, the same lifestyle, the same, in a sense, the same education, because the end of the day, again, the, the hardcore traditional values were, were all the same. They were being mirrored in, in the same church and the same empire after all, in spite of the, organi say, the, the hierarchical organizational and also ideological and even doctrinal differences. Um, but the, um, the, the people were just living normally with two power, the two powers compenetrating each other. So Again, the Sutri agreement is mostly to be understood practically as a peace between papacy and empire. After decades of strenuous fighting, of exhaustion, of significant damage uh, that would go on for a while, because by the way, especially in Germany, yeah, because after the conquered date, the conquered death of Worms, that the matter was eleven years later, the matter was settled. Fundamentally, again, accepting this new papal monarchy that before had never existed. I mean, w one century before, it would have 
not even be conceivable under the Ottonians to to say the papacy what can do so it was obviously like a matter of saying the papacy first of all owns this this power everywhere in Western Christendom but also fundamentally as the the volumes agreement um, stated like things vary depending on whether you're talking about Germany uh, or Burgundy or Italy because that shows how far does the respectively imperial or the papal uh, power st stretches geographically in a, in a concrete sense uh, on again kingdoms that made up the empire right so that in theory were to be ruled just simply by uniformly by the secular authority with the same mechanisms that no right in fact in the Sutra agreement there were also various negotiations uh, negotiations regarding the uh the vexata question of the uh papal temporal recognition of papal temporal power by the emperor on Lazio on Umbria on the on Romagna etc that as you know it's something that the pope had asked and even more frankly in the beginning to, to even to to pep in the short that's time so, so those are that's yet another enormous question and that's why the issue didn't end there that's why papas in empire kept struggling uh, for many other reasons but again this first settlement allowed especially the papacy to start building further what would become during the 12th and especially in the 13th the the enormous the, the incredible ecumenic power that it was factually and in germany also triggering very interesting dynamics because after all up to this point even though with difficulty the you know the the, the putting together of the ethnic duchies in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom had began, right? And the uh, the investor struggle, in a sense, halted that development, right? In, from the conquered that of Worms, and even before, from all these, you know, decades of, of war before, Germany was, uh, you know, was in turmoil, it was in unstable. It's not before Frederick the I, Conor the third that or even before actually yes because it was Lothar of Supplement but it's eighty um it's not yeah in fact until the mid twelfth century with Frederick Barbarossa that the, uh, the at that point probably the German kingdom as it started being called uh really uh had another shot to, to coalesce and to launch again an imperial policy on on a universal scale. Which was also a, a great, uh, you know, cause of uh, of resentment and of bitterness from the side of the Germans as well. I mean, even this struggle against the Lombard League that was supported by the Papas in all the wars that resumed were fundamentally still about this aspect, about this unsettled um, uh, issue with with the Papacy that had stripped. The, the empire this kind of scissor papistic model that in fact under in Barbarossa's times was being mutuated back from essentially from the Byzantine culture where the where the patriarch of Constantinople is subjected to the emperor can even the emperor can even kill him right um, and with the revival of Roman law by the Bolognese University etc that was working for the emperor to reestablish that Roman principle that originally was about the sacrality of the imperium per se. And it's interesting too, in fact, how uh, the same First Crusade that was factually managed by, by the papacy, even though Urban II wasn't really, you know, we don't have to think the papacy actually... Um, let's say pushed for the for the expedition per se right or at least uh, as as what the crusade would have become and, and the reason of this is that aside from the fact that various european monarchs were just engulfed in their own problems some were excommunicated and or at war with each other but the barons the knights the 
of Europe still felt traditionally the sacrality of the Cingulum Militaris and of the Imperium per se. And so this is part of the reason also why the, um, the Papal Legates what were sent to Jerusalem after 1099 were um, fundamentally just uh, halted because there was still the idea that after all what derives uh, from as as the the faculty of ruling is is directly given by god and with this medium that the church fundamentally represents and christendom in practice does um but this was also in fact a liminal um field where still civilization at that point couldn't quite properly recover from i mean by medieval times um, we have to understand why, first of all, why the issue was still there, uh, but also why it couldn't be surpassed, why, why it was, after all, beneficial to have such a, you know, a check and balance bent system, and how this, um, uh, let's say, this papal control on the same imperial authority did bring, did avoid properly a, a scolarization of the same western empire like as it uh, power as it had happened in the in constantinople instead so um it's um it's a complex um issue that we will perhaps explain better on another occasion because sometimes it's approached just from both sides but it doesn't quite make sense in my opinion right it's always both right the, these two forces were always meant to be complementary uh, in any case the, the the issue never ends because again you would say that the empire would have had to prevail um in a in an absolute sense um this was evidently not the case and you can see the the church as an antagonistic force but what resistance would it, what, you know, testing the limit of an infinite power, is it feasible if this power is not infinite itself, right? In the broader struggle between the Uranic and the Ketonic dimension, you had the Uranic one has, the Uranic one should win in theory. And if it doesn't, there is something that doesn't work in it, right? So this is what the older tradition actually believed and so that's why the middle ages are also interesting because the popes did have temporal power themselves so we're looking at something um much more dual and again this thing of this double thread thing is what prevented sc uh, sclerotization on the longer run right didn't prevent from decay because that is just the, the broader premise of civilization and, and tr of tradition but at the same time it always makes you mind about why this is the case that's why i find it ever more fascinating the issue of the investiture struggles because um again i think that without it there, there would have not been in the west that level of depth and of at the end of the day of super moral superiority that other civilizations might have held at some point, but didn't weren't, weren't capable of uh, maintaining. And uh, this is true again for every power. And I think this was um, like a a very important initiation um, in the capacity of again of the same imperium to to shine in in the Middle Ages the way it did as a as a last tail streak of, of, of tradition, essentially. In any case, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.